So stats in golf have developed a lot over probably the last five to 10 years in particular. We would look at the past scoring from that course in an event there. We would look at how the field have played it, how the winners played it, and how the player has played it, if they've been there. Yeah. Um, we would then pick out the key scoring holes and then how the field and winner have played them and see the separation. We have a massive database of, of different pin positions. So I might get to a venue and think, okay, the rough is really thick this week. We need to have an emphasis on fairways. That might then lead me to my training within certain clubs off the tee. You can then start to dive into themes. Do you have a lot of major misses off the tee with a particular club in a particular wind direction to a particular, is there a left or right bias to your shot pattern? Um, and then you can start diving into, into more questions. We can then use that data to superimpose shot patterns onto any hole in the world, as opposed to looking at just the strokes gain numbers in different categories, looking at fairways hit, greens hit. We try and put a little bit more context to that. So Hello and welcome back to my channel. And today's guest is James Wilson, who is a professional golf analyst. So James actually played professional golf himself, but now spends his time analyzing top professional golfers that travel the world playing on the various different golf tours. So it's a really interesting conversation. We speak about the different data and metrics that are inside the world of golf. Uh, what James gets up to on a weekly basis, how he prepares players for different tournaments and things like the different variables that you probably don't think of that have a big effect on the analysis of golf, such as the type of course, the weather, the equipment, etc. So loads of things to unpack and it's a very, very interesting conversation. So if you haven't already subscribed, please do hit the subscribe button just below the video so you get more videos just like this. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation with James Wilson. James, welcome to the channel. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to this, James. So, um, and apologise if you can hear the wind in the background. We're recording this storm. Was it Storm Debbie this time? So it's not the not the best conditions for playing golf. But obviously, we'll, we want to get into to all things golf, really, with yourself. Obviously, um, coming from a lot of playing background, but also that analysis as well that we spoke about. So, um, what I typically do, James, is first of all, I'll pass it over to the guests. So, for those that don't know who you are, if you just want to give a bit of an overview, kind of a bit of your background, and then we'll get into into a bit more specifics as we go through. Sure, yeah. So um, my name is James Wilson. I work with a number of players on the PGA, European and uh, live golf tours around the world, looking after their uh, performance analysis, really, and how they can use data to, one, improve um, their game, their strategy, but also in, from a coaching aspect as well. What areas can they get better at? Can their technical coach step in in certain areas? Um, and my background really comes from playing. Um, I grew up playing at a good level. I, I turned pro in, in 2012, competed on, on various tours around the world, had some success, and then COVID changed a lot um, and got into the performance analysis side with um, one of the players I used to travel with. Mm. And uh, when I look back now, a lot of the work I did as a player is actually been quite linked to my work I now do as a, as a, as a performance coach analyst. So um, it sort of blended quite well together. And I'd like to think the playing experiences I've had have, have been quite a key role into why we've done quite well and what we do with the players on tour. Yeah, perfect. So what we'll do then is we'll start with the playing side then, James, if that's all right. So you mentioned you turned pro 2012. So how, how old were you then? How old were you? When I was you... Uh, 22 when I turned pro. Um, I had a decent sort of junior and amateur career. I, I'd, I'd finished sort of runner-up in English boys. I'd competed for my county at all various age levels and um, it was fairly sort of solid amateur career. Um made the step into the professional game. I went, my first event was in Turkey um, on the Pro Golf Tour is what it's called now, which is where uh, Martin Keimer sort of developed his game. Mm. Um, and then the top five or six would promote get promoted from that tour onto the Challenge Tour, and then the Challenge Tour so leads to the European Tour or DP World now. Um, I so sort of never got onto the, the, the highest level of tour, but I sort of won in Morocco, which was great. Um, sort of when I look back I was always a shot around away from getting up to that next level mm. um and golf is what we know is it's very fine margins at a high level so um I think what I've picked up from from my game playing and how I would go about things I sort of tweaked a little bit with the players I work with now um, and sort of try and put my own experiences into the sort of the coaching side now yeah Perfect. So, and, and like I said before we started recording, James, your, your LinkedIn profile doesn't give much away, so I, I don't know too much. So, do you, in terms of the, the background then from starting there, do you come from, a, is your family, is it golfing background there? or? Yeah, my uh, my granddad was a very good golfer um, and he was also a, a past president of the English Golf Union. Right. Um, and he 
actually devised the existing handicap system uh, that was used before we recently changed over to the the, the funny one that there is now. Mm. Um, so again, without any sort of pre-planned work, I've ended up in sort of stats analysis, which is sort of his area too yeah. within golf. Um, but he was a good golfer. My my dad is a is a decent golfer, um, sort of 12, 13 handicap. Um, and then um, I, I obviously came around and I just fell in love with it. I love I love just love hitting a ball, simple as that, really. And even now, I don't play as much, but I, I love practicing. I love the art of trying to get better um, and trying to find things within my what my game that I can maybe sort of find that one percent in in my own area. Um, even though I don't play as much, I think it's golf's not a fun game when you play badly. So I try and work on it to try and keep pretty competitive. Yeah, definitely. Probably the mo- yeah, a very frustrating game. Um, most of my rounds, anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, perfect. So, and then in that kind of from that the the journey from kind of amateur to pro, then I'm presuming that's. I mean, just talk about the kind of the the journey of that kind of was in terms of like sponsorships, and because I I, I'm, I don't know anything about that in terms of how yeah. you would survive, because obviously you're doing all these traveling and you go into these events, um, and obviously that's, that's to take some money to enter these tournaments and play and travel. So how does it kind of look from a sponsorship point of view, and do you rely heavily on that uh, that kind yeah, of? Yeah, it, it's difficult really because unless you're at the the highest level in golf now, um, it's it's very reliant on on funding. Uh, like you say, traveling around the world isn't cheap. Um, so that was something I had a little bit of to start with. And then after that, it was sort of my own sort of self-sufficient really. And, yeah. um, you know, I had a bit of success here and there, which, which helps. And, and then, um, you know, COVID comes along and things change significantly. You look, you can't play for, for nearly 18 months. You couldn't travel. Um, and as a golfer for what I was doing, that was obviously a big impact. And that was really sort of what led me into down this route. So I think with, with golfers now, I would say, um, if you are turning pro, you need to have like a, a two year, two, three year plan in place from a financial point of view to where you can you can really go away and play freely. I think if you're thinking about the money and every penny, I think that's it's a really difficult place to play. Yeah. It's an extra pressure, isn't it? Probably you don't need exactly. That. And 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 personally, I never played for the money either. I played because I loved I loved the game. I wanted to get to a certain level. I wanted to try and be as good as I could be. Yeah. Um, and the money never really came into it. And I think a lot of players would say the same they don't tend to stand over a shot and think this is for x amount or whatever mm. um but i think if you've got the you know the mindset of that i think it just adds that extra little bit of pressure that you don't need yeah yeah definitely so and then in terms of kind of your background in so where did i know predominantly now you are performance coach performance analyst when it comes to the golf but did you have, incorporate that into your game when you were playing and, and where did that yeah. come from was that always something that you did or yeah, no, good question. Um, and it's funny, it's only really since I've started doing it, I realised that's what I did. Um, mm. So stats in golf have developed a lot over probably the last five to 10 years in particular. Um, mm. They've gone from sort of very basic traditional stuff to quite sort of in-depth things now. Um, but when I was playing, one of the things that I did, um, I sort of realised that stats at the time were a little bit vague. Um, so I would go down more of the route of sort of my own assessment of my game. Um, so what I mean by that, I would uh, write down at every venue that I would go to three or four things that the course required. Um, and that's very similar to now the pre-tournament work that I do for players, which we'll, we'll touch on as we're going along. Um, so I might get to a venue and think, OK, the rough is really thick this week. We need to have an emphasis on fairways. That might then lead me to my training within certain clubs off the tee strategy related do i need to um, lay back to prioritize accuracy Um, or is it better getting the ball further up the hole um, and go in with a a wedge from the rough something like that so i that's what i would do myself whenever i got to a venue i would also write down three or four goals i had for the week whether that would be um, performance related um, or whether that would be sort of general things for the week such as um, I want to achieve three gym sessions during the week because I know mid-season my fitness would start to dip Um, so little things like that I was doing uh, without realizing as such and I would make my actually um, you might you'll you'll know Clive Woodward obviously the rugby world cup coach Um, he was involved in something with my coach at the time um, in a platform called Hive I think it was Mm. um, Hive Learning and that the idea of that was to put all your knowledge into this online book. Um, so what I did with there, my coach, every lesson I had went in there, video analysis, 
any interesting article that I read, uh, whether that's fitness, nutrition, mental, technical, I would put it into this online book. I would put all my notes from the week, uh, the tournament week I played in there. And what you end up with is this library of knowledge um, that you can revert back to and say, okay, what, what have I done when I've played my best golf or vice versa? It was there anything I wasn't doing when I was playing poorly that I would be doing elsewhere. And, yeah. and when you add all that up, it's very similar to what I do now for players, but I just do it on a, on a much bigger scale. Um, I've got a lot more access to things. Yeah. We have a road map that we've got um, with caught up game. And that's um, the idea with that is to really put what I was doing sort of on a much bigger platform. Yeah, definitely. So we'll come on to up game soon because we'll definitely talk about that and what that's it, yeah. what that involves. I think you mentioned in there a little bit to, in terms of fitness, James, as well like as you were playing. And I suppose yeah. two questions here. So when you were playing, how did that look like from a fitness perspective for you? Did you have to employ? We did. Was it all on you, or did you have coaches that you employed yourself, or how did that look? Yeah, that was all on on me. I think that's it. it what it is in golf as an individual, it's, yeah. it comes down to you. Um, I was fortunate knowing certain players i had a bit of access to some of their coaches as well which was great but i had um i spent a bit of time in portugal during the winter um had a really good trainer out there where i would see fairly regularly and then i always found it difficult to keep it going throughout the season um in golf you tended to have this off season so sort of november december time yeah. um, and you could do a lot of work in that period and then you get busy um competing throughout the year um, and that was really the notes I would make during the week. My goals I would set would be to to sort of put some accountability on my own work. Um, like I knew from past experiences, I tired during the the season. Um, it wasn't something I measured as such, but I just felt it. And when I would go back into a training sort of period, um, you could see straight away. So I made a conscious effort to to try and keep that going. And on the road, that's tough, isn't it? Sometimes you don't have gyms. Um, mm-hmm. You don't stay in the most glamorous hotels a lot of the time. Um, and it was very much sort of down to me uh, to try and sort of push myself to do that. And I would say I was, I was pretty decent at it. I was certainly good at the mobility side. That that stayed with me. Uh, every morning I'll still do my mobility. Mm. Um, but as as much as that, traveling with the right people, um, that was a big thing for me, that the lads I traveled with were all um, very sort of similar mindset uh, orientated. Whoever we shared a room with or traveled with was was never any problem um, and we could always sort of push each other a little bit yeah. I think that's quite important in an individual sport so um, I was lucky in that aspect that you know even on a day where you you might not be as motivated to do something you've got other people around you yeah. um, who can sort of bring you up yeah cool so so then what did and um, obviously we'll do this question again from, a, from the analyst point of view but as you were playing then James what did what was your because what would your week like your average week how often were you on the on the driving range how often were you playing how often were you competing and how did it kind of look on on that kind of average week yeah we would play about sort of 20 to 24 events a year um throughout this throughout the season that was from january to october time um so it's a fairly sort of busy busy spell in in a in a 10 month period um and i would really look at my my training in blocks i'd look at the schedule um then i'll put my training around that and Certainly off season was was the heavy work. And then you would it'd be a lot of maintenance work throughout the rest of the season. And then when you had a break, that's maybe where you sort of took stock of things, uh, looked what was good, what needed to improve, and and try and implement a plan in that period. But I think with a lot of golfers, um, the way schedules are, um, and your tent and the sort of desire to play, it it's easy to get sucked into the trap of playing, 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 as opposed to sort of taking stock. Yeah. what's good what's not what do i need to do and then go in again um and i i fell into that trap for sure at certain times um but then certainly as i got a little bit older sort of into my sort of late mid to late 20s um i realized that maybe missing an event here and there that didn't suit my game yeah. could actually be really beneficial going into the next three or four events where uh, i knew I, I had good results in the past or i liked the venue um and what stats don't show uh, is the momentum factor you know if you can build momentum in throughout the season yeah. that could be a really big thing yeah perfect so just finally then on your kind of planes kind of uh, side of things james was there any kind of, you mentioned you won in you said you won in morocco so you obviously morocco, talked, yeah is, is where can you where are the do you have any favorite courses that you played at where yeah. about, you mentioned you're I, in the I, northwest base aren't you so i'm supposing yeah. well, who, what's your hometown kind of course my home course is formby golf club which is great um sort of one of the 
top 40 courses in the country mm. um that's, uh, and it's home it's, I, I love it but we're also spoiled in the area with royal birddale hillside sna lytham so where the open was this year royal liverpool was great for me because i was working there and um, i could stay at home so we're really lucky in the in the area i live um and uh in terms of traveling and playing at morocco we went to a lot um early on in in the season um couple of courses that I used on the DP World Tour. Um, one in Rabat in particular was called Royal Dar es Salaam, I think. And that's probably one of the toughest courses I've ever played. Yeah. Um, and, and it's the toughest, one of the toughest on tour as well, on, on the DP World. You see the scores from there. Last few years are always high. Yeah. Uh, that was great. Where I won in Agadir was was brilliant. Um, I beat Antoine Rosner, who, who's currently doing quite well on tour um, in a playoff. So that was that was a good moment. Um so I was really lucky to travel, so play different courses. Different types of courses are interesting as well, the different grass types that you get. That's mm. another factor from that you have to adapt to when you're traveling and and something that I now look into with players. Um, I think that was when I was playing, you you don't always realize the effect of that on your game and how you might need to adapt accordingly. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I've been uh, been to some really good places, but I think probably the favorite course would probably be King's Barns in, um, in Scotland. So that's yeah. probably my best nice nice right so let's, let's kind of transition to to the analysis kind of side of things now then james so um you mentioned kind of you were kind of doing this for yourself anyway as you're playing you would kind of do whether you want to call it journaling or whatever you were tracking these these kind of metrics and things and they have developed over time so you've touched on the the app as well up game so how how did you make that transition to to doing what you're doing now in terms of because you said you're, you're not you're no longer playing right now this is the first year you're not playing um yep. so, so how did you kind of make that transition and, and basically why as well and yeah what, so so when covid came around i knew golf was going to struggle um for a while especially with the schedule that i had um which was travel based um being from the uk in that period was quite difficult um in terms of leaving the country coming back here and quarantine and all that sort of stuff mm. um and I realized that quite early. And I was lucky that uh, one of the players I used to travel with, Tom of Boys, he had stopped playing and was moved into his stats. Um, and he was very stats orientated when we were rooming together, traveling. Yeah. And, uh, and it's funny when I look back, he was doing the numbers and I was doing the journaling. And now we've sort of blended things together. Yeah. Um, and he had started working with some elite players, such as Tommy Fleetwood, Jason Day, Matt Wallace, um, and, and was sort of, putting some of his sort of spin on stats at the time mm. um COVID came around he was busy and he needed someone to come on and, and help out and that's where I was able to step in um and I talk about earlier how it's surrounding yourself with the right people and when I was traveling and and that and similar now it, it sort of led into that um and it got me into the the analyst side it and um from the work that we type we do it all fit quite well mm. Yeah. So do you, so you mentioned you work with different players on tours and different, you know, of all different rankings. I mean, and there's obviously some good players in there in terms of how does that look? Do you travel to the tournaments with them? Do you, do you, some do that and some it's just all remote? How, how does that look? Yeah, it's quite varied really. It depends a little bit on, on the player. Um, I, I have players on three different tours, live PGA Europe. So it's tough to see all of them a lot because you go into three different tours. You might see them, four times each in a year, but that's 12 weeks away. Right. So, um, so that, that's always a juggling act. Um, obviously we'll tend to try and do the UK ones if we can, you know, if we can. Um, and then obviously we'll, we'll sort of dip, drip feed things throughout the year. Um, but in terms of like a, a regular, uh, regular week, a lot of the stuff is done at home. Um, it's done on the laptop, preparing things for the week ahead. And then um, we'll sort of go periodically. Uh, to events i'm actually off to australia on wednesday yeah. um the australian open is on in a couple of weeks in sydney so i'm doing that with mm. with one of my clients out there so nice. um, quite varied and then the work we do at events is varied as well some players uh, they will use us more for the practice side of things um others will use it for maybe for strategy yeah. um so it, it's very varied depending on the player yeah so then in and this question more of a in general thing really than james is like in terms of performance analysis in golf would you say <clears throat> and I presume you and you mentioned obviously Tom that you work with more kind of data side. Are you doing video analysis as well? Is that is that part of what you're doing, or is it more the stats? More stats, but it's funny you mentioned that it is something we have drip fed into our pre torn reports for venues that we may not have much um, data on, or mm. or maybe even where there's been a lot, we might put in past highlights from a course. Yeah. Um, 
So, for example, if um, if a player, if we know we've had a tournament there in the past and we've got sort of highlights from rounds one, two, three, four, um, we'll maybe put them in and say, this is how the course has played in this particular round and there'll be highlights. So we've, we've started to use it, but in terms of like strategy based, it's not really a big thing. It's more just what's to come. What, what, yeah. what does the course look like and what's it, how's it going to play? Yeah. So would you, if, so let's say I'm playing the Australian Open and you're kind of doing the kind of pre-game the kind of strategy and, and how does that is that come in the form of a report is it a, do you get on zoom with the the players if you're not there and, and kind of what types of things are going to be included in that in that yeah. whole thing really so it will be in a, a report fairly sort of hefty report i reckon they're probably 20 30 pages long because each hole has its as its own page so probably a little bit longer probably up to 30 pages yeah. we would uh look at the past scoring from that course in the past yeah. um, if it's been an event there we would look at how the field have played it, how the winners played it, and how the player has played it, if they've been there. Yeah. Um, we would then pick out the key scoring holes, uh, which are invariably the par fives, um, and then how the field and winner have played them and see the separation. Um, but also as well, the really strong holes. Golf is quite often about um, damage limitation, sort of avoiding drop shots. And we'll look at the, um, the difficult holes on the course. Do they match up with, with your performance or maybe you found all the holes that are much more difficult than the field have and then we would dive into that for them and say okay well we know in the past you've played this hole in plus one you've hit driver all four times and you've missed left all four times Mm -hmm. we then might work back from there and say to the caddy or the player depending on who we sort of deal with the most um, look at this hole from a strategy perspective is there a better option off the tee Mm -hmm. um and, and work that way. We then might look at, and what we'll do is pass pins. So you'll have the pin section on each day. Um, yeah. And they can be very different day to day. A back right flag with water near that flag could produce very high scoring. Mm. And that's one where we will guide the players and the caddy into respecting that pin. They might round three, have it at the front left and there's no real danger near it. And then you can be more aggressive. Um, so using that, sort of past data that's available combined with the past player data, how they've played the course is, is our sort of approach to, to really guiding them on how to, how to plan for the week. I, I, I'm hesitant to say to a player, do this, do that. I don't think that's sort of our approach um, yeah. and playing golf by maths and numbers is, is for some people, but it's, it's probably not our way. I think we are more down the lines of um, what this course require what have you done well here in the past? What have you not done well here in the past? Yep. And then feeding in three or four key points for the week to focus on. Yeah. So in terms of that data then from, um, you mentioned, say it was that course, you'd look at the, the winners of that tournament in the past. So all of that data from other players, is that readily available online for people, that anyone to get, or is that something that pretty, is? No, pretty much. You can go on the DP World website, and that's a pretty easy website to pull everything off. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've then got to put it somewhere and, and get all the data out of it, but it, it's pretty easy to pull. Um, that's where we provide most of our, mm. our players' work. PGA Tour, there's um, so there's some back-end stuff, which is only available to the yeah. player or the team, which we get access to. Um, but there's, I think in golf now, there's there's so much out there on on websites and um, things like that that you can sort of dive into pretty much anything you want. Yeah, perfect. So, I mean, in terms of some of their metrics, then, because you said right at the start that, that they've obviously developed over time from basic things to now maybe new things and even things that maybe you guys are, have come up with yourself. So um, are you able to kind of delve into a little bit of that, James, in terms of what kind of things or what kind of stats you might actually be looking at and recording and delivering in these reports? Yeah, so I think one of the, the most widely used and known metric now is strokes gained in golf. And, it, and basically what that is, is where have you gained or lost relative to the field on each given day? Um, in different parts of the game. Um, and obviously, the more the more you gain, the, the better you're going to do. Um, that's great. It's been, it, it's now the metric in golf. Um, one thing I found when I was using it to play in is that unless you're using it on tour where it gets adjusted every day for things like the weather conditions, if you're playing a really tough course, that baseline changes. Yeah. You can end up with a very negative outlook on your game. And that's what I found with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we've got within within up game is things to put context to strokes gained. So as opposed to looking at just the strokes gained numbers in different categories, looking at fairways hit, greens hit, 
we try and put a little bit more context to that. So we would have metrics such as in play, minor, major, and penalty misses off the tee. So you could hit a really good tee shot that goes in the semi-rough. Traditionally, you're marked down as the fairway missed, and, yeah. then, and then that would be it. You wouldn't know any more about it. But semi-rough is quite often perfectly fine to play from. It's, it's in play. In particular, if you're on a short path four going for the green and your green side, you're probably going to be in the rough, but it's actually a really good tee shot. You could miss a ball, miss a tee shot 10 yards in the rough and it's fine. You could miss a tee shot 10 yards in the rough and it's in a bush, you know, mm-hmm. and, that, and that difference is completely different. So that's where the in-play minor major metrics that we've used have been popular. Um, you can then start to dive into themes. Do you have a lot of major misses off the tee with a particular club in a particular wind direction to a particular, is there a left or right bias to your shot pattern? Um, and then you can start diving into, into more questions. Is that equipment related? Is that coming when the water's down one particular side and that might be mental related? Um, or is it pure technical aspect? So there's there's a whole host of different things. And then and similar with the approach play, um, traditionally it was just have you hit the green or miss the green. Um, we would now class it as obviously a green hit, an easy miss. So that might be somewhere on the fringe where you're putting from, yeah. um, or a standard chip shot. The medium miss, which would be where a lot of short game shots would fall, um, somewhere where there's no real obstacle, you're sort of good chance of an up and down, and then a hard miss, and that could be plugged in a bunker, short side, lob shot, thick rough. Um, and then from there, what you'll get is a, a really good uh, understanding of the player's game. Are they missing greens in the right positions, or are they missing greens in very poor positions? Yeah. And then that leads on to things like strategy. Are you hitting the ball close to your intended target, which we'll measure in the app, um, and th- and that's too aggressive? Mm. Or are you hitting the ball a long way from where you're trying to do? And that's why the misses are in difficult positions. Um, and that's really our our whole philosophy in the app is, is looking at how good you are at hitting the ball versus your intended target, which is ultimately what golf is, is all about. Your, your target isn't necessarily the fairway or the flag. Um, you know, if depending where the pin is, quite often you're aiming away from it. Yeah. Um, and that leads us onto a lot of different things. And uh, we can then use that data to um, superimpose shot patterns onto any hole in the world where we can say, okay, to this back left flag, in this window, we would suggest aiming 10 feet, 15 feet to the right based on your pattern. And your pattern might be very different to my pattern. Mm. So all of a sudden, you can really start tailoring it to the individual. Yeah, perfect. So just you mentioned pin positions there, and this shows my naivety, really, James. So the, in terms of on a tournament, you know, when they would change the pin position on the next day, is that, do you, would you know that before the tournament, or is that a decision they make after the first round and then they change it for the second? How, how does that work? I never knew that. The tour will know. Uh, during the week where they're going to put them as a, as a from my side I won't but um, the caddies will tend to get them the night before um, each day mm-hmm. and they can also see the dots on the greens during the round so they can say okay round two is going to be here yeah. so they'll get a, a heads up um, but what you will find is on greens there's usually only four to six areas that they're going to put the pins because they move them around try and put them in different spots yeah. um so we tend that we have a massive database of of different pin positions from different years. And we can say this pin is a real tough one. Um, the other three are fine. And then that can guide the player in a caddy on the practice round to say, okay, this is why it's tough. Um, mm-hmm. We need to avoid that. Um, and then we you can build your strategy off that. And golf at the highest level really is about um, sort of very marginal gains and, a hole might play at 4.25 if you play in four a par you've gained a quarter of a shot and if you do that a few times around um, that's where you sort of start to separate yourself yeah and and what about kind of you mentioned obviously driving which is obvious in the short game what about kind of putting is there anything that can be done there and what, what are you looking at when it comes to putting yeah um i think a couple of things one is um you're holding out from inside 50 feet that's the area and for sort of people who want to get better at putting, I think that would be a big thing for them. Um, but we would look at things like grass types for players. You know, Bermuda grass is very different to bent grass mm-hmm. um, and players can perform differently on on depending on the grass. Um, a lot of that can come from the how they've been brought up, where they've been brought up, li- what sort of conditions they've lived in. Um, so that would be something we'll, we'll flag up with the players. Um, 
And then we'll also look at things like different breaker pots. You know, is a player better right to left pots versus left to right pots? Yeah. Um, and usually for right-handed golfer, the left to right ones tend to be more difficult. Um, but every now and then uh, you'll see the opposite. And, and in an ideal world, you want to try and get them as, as equal as possible. Um, yeah. And again, that leads into the conversation with the coaching team. If they are weaker in one particular break of pot, that can guide the, the, the technical coach into, into their specific area. Why is that uh, the case? And I think that's that's really at the forefront of our mind with the work is providing the, the data that can lead the technical coaches um, into sort of the root cause of a potential issue. Um, yeah. And sort of finally on the putting as well, speed control. Um, we would have different metrics with that. Maybe other people we would look at, um, obviously hold if you hold the past, uh, so hold the putt. Um, but then we would have a safe zone past and a safe zone short metric. And what that is, is anything within two feet of the hole. Um, the reason we put that in is um, if you hit the ball within two feet, you're pretty much guaranteed to make that next putt. So we know speed is then pretty good if you're within the safe zone outside the safe zone we've got past and short and obviously if you're in once you start going outside of three feet that's where you're running the risk of a of a three putt yeah. um, so we can start to get a better understanding of players speed control is have they got poor speed and is that linked to their low conversion rate or is their speed very good and it's actually um, specific break of putts that might be a problem or grass types etc yeah. so uh, so really that's how we would look at look at the pot in and put it put it all together yeah i mean one thing that is obviously fascinating is all the different variables that you can't really control like you mentioned that like the grass types the the weather which could be not just the wind the rain the humidity and stuff like that so how do, and not not just from a from the perspective of the analyst james really but how does all of that kind of thing play into into the game really in terms of checking the way you know being making sure you're on board with what's going on around the whole situation massively and i think so last week in south africa was a good example of the altitude uh, so that's not so much weather but more climate yeah. um the ball goes miles um mm. over in south africa because they're so high at that in places and that can change the yardages massively mm. yeah. how far you hit the ball so one of the first things we do at a venue like that is first thing in the week dial in the distance control they've all got trap mans these days which are launch monitors and will tell you how far each ball goes and travels mm. how much it spins and that would be one of the first things we would encourage players to do on arrival, get that dialed in early on um, so you know how far the ball's going and then you're good to go for the rest of the week. Yeah. When it comes to things like weather, um, which is very much out of out of your control, caddies play a massive part. I think that's, that's not seen on TV. Um, I think caddies are very much reliant on um, relied on for wind direction, wind strength, and that's really where they excel i think uh, i've been around some really good caddies and the awareness of where the wind is mm. uh, how much it might affect shots is is very very good and i think that can separate a good caddy and a great caddy yeah. as well um because of you know the distance the ball goes it I mean playing the day out today it would be very difficult to control your ball yeah. uh, and that can have a massive impact obviously in your performance and then Things like rain as well, like if it's rained at a venue for a week before, that course is going to play very different to if it's been firm and fast um, in the build up to it. And that might affect club selection as well. Um, so if you've got something that's um, lush, rough, wet, playing long, you might put a hybrid in the bag as opposed to a long iron. A little bit easier to hit or out the rough, uh, which might be a bit more juicy. Um, and then the vice versa is you go to a, a major championship course like the Open where it's firm, fast running, you might take out a five wood and put in a two iron uh, just to get a lower trajectory, help in the windy conditions um, and sort of combat the wind or weather really by using equipment, equipment to your advantage. Yeah, perfect. So then you touch on the caddy there then, uh, James, like the role of the caddy in general. I know you, I mean, have you caddied yourself for, for people? I, I have no idea. But what... Yeah, I, I couldn't handle that role. <laughs> so just what is that? What does that role entail? You, men you mentioned kind of, being on top of the weather, obviously they're, they're there to be the kind of right-hand man for the golfer, but what else does that job entail and why is it so important? Yeah, I think, for, first of all, from our side, most of them are the ones who put the data in um, into our app to get us back to it. Yeah. To back to us. So that's a really important thing for us. Um, sticking on that theme, the, the team aspect of them giving 
an honest assessment. They're the ones who are actually out there watching the shots, feeling the emotion, seeing the strike. Yeah. Um, they'll give maybe a, a non-emotional view of the player's game that we can then guide the stats with as well. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes, obviously, that's, that's good to get that perception as opposed to just the player. Yeah. Um, so that would be the first thing. And then on course, I think there's there's a lot of different facets to it. I think one, keeping a player calm, relaxed, um, confident. You know, when they're coming down the, the stretch trying to win a tournament, you want someone who uh, is fully in your corner and you can trust what they're saying is is purely for your benefit. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the weather can play a massive part in a caddy's role, especially if it's raining. That's a very difficult job to do. Um, but things like getting the yardages, the numbers right is important. And then quite often the ones who work with us, um, being aware of the player's tendencies. So if if they know they have a left bias to a left pin, they might help the player and say, okay, well, let's pick a slightly more conservative target here um, and guiding the strategy a little bit, discussing it with the player. Um, and similar for um, for things like, club setup during the week we had one of my clients last week in south africa the caddy was adamant he needed to take out a long iron and put a hybrid in because of the par fives mm. were long quite often the second shot was over water um, and having that extra bit of height um was going to help so the the caddy plays a big role in uh, in various different parts as well yeah Perfect. So then let's kind of delve a little bit into the app a little bit more then, James, because you mentioned that. So the app is called Upgame. So you mentioned that the caddies and, and maybe the players in some cases will input the data. So can you talk us a bit more around the app, What it's, you know, who, who has access to it? And can is it just for professionals? Can can anybody use it and input the data? And just a little bit more. We have, uh, we have two versions of it. We have a basic and a pro version. Anyone can get either version. Uh, the basic is what it is. It's streamlined stats, it's strokes gain, traditional stats. Um, the pro version has what our metrics are, your intended target line that players will put on so we know where they're trying to hit the ball to and where they actually hit it, um, which allows us to do some of the things we've talked about. Um, and then the other met sort of metrics to put context to things. Um, we have a practice section in the app where we've put some training games in there where anyone can go and do and um, compete against other users, see where their score stacks up. That's been really popular for federations and academies because they can put all players into a group, set their training challenges that they want to monitor, and then players enter the score. And you can start to see, is a player trending in a particular practice challenge? Are they getting better in that area? And does that correlate to improved performance? So in an ideal world, you'd want to see a player who's practice getting better, their on-course performance getting better. If not, then that opens up a discussion, okay, why not? What can we do to bridge that gap between practice and performance? Yeah. Uh, when we first launched the app as a beta version, we had a couple of users on tour um, trying it. But we this year in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and DP World, we peaked at 25% of the field we're using it, which was great. So we had, you know, we've got some really elite level players now using it, which is starting to now help with our research for things to say, well, this is really what players are doing at this level as opposed to sort of estimating. Um, and then it's gone. Um, we've got a lot, of, a lot of colleges in the US using it, um, which is now sort of our next phase, sort of what does a top 50 amateur in the world look like? What does a top 100 amateur in the world look like? That can be really useful for recruitment purposes, for management companies, equipment people, um, sort of similar to your background in football, you know, who, who do you want to look at recruiting? Well, a bit of data behind that can actually be uh, be very beneficial to it. Yeah, um, and then uh, like I mentioned earlier, we've got sort of a number of uh, just clients on various tours, um, elite amateurs using it themselves. But um, so yeah, no, it's been good. And then we've, uh, we've today actually just signed a deal with the Ladies European Tour, and they're going to be uh, using the app. Uh, they've started using it already, but from next year, they'll fully launch it, where all the players will use the app, enter their data, um, and then we'll now get. Uh, the stats from the ladies European tour that we'll give back to them. We can provide nice. strokes gained, which they've never had before. So yeah. uh, that'll be really good to sort of start getting a deeper insight into, into ladies golf as well. Nice. Perfect. Sounds good. I mean, in terms of then the, like, and well, the question that I'm going to ask you now goes for like the, the, the elite golfers, so really like the top, the, the top players. I'm just curious to know what kind of support staff they will have other than, so they might obviously have an analyst that the, the, the caddy, obviously, but what else, 
what are the support and people are around them to, to make up that team? Because we've said it's an individual sport, but there's a lot that goes into it, I'm sure. Like you said, they're an individual sport and each individual is different in what they want. Um, I have a top 40 client in the world who it's literally just him, his coach, technical coach, his manager, yeah. caddy and myself, and that's it. So it's quite a small team. Yeah. Um, and that's quite nice in a way because you can just, you know who you're going to and then you just leave it there. Um, we have other players who might have, um, they'll have their fitness trainer, they'll have uh, their nutritionist, they'll have a physio. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden things start getting, obviously you'll, you'll be dealing with different types of conversations with a physio than you would be to the technical coach. Yeah. So we might look at how a player is performing in the start of the round versus the end of the round, how a player is performing in the first week back after a break versus fourth week in a row. Um, what's their best week? And then you try and tailor schedules around that as well. Yeah. Um, so every every player is a little bit different, but I'd say the sort of common things, themes now are uh, most players are starting to do stats, whether that's themselves or with people like myself. Um, your technical coach is, is a pretty constant. Yeah. Short game and potting coaches uh, become very popular over the over the past few years. Um, and then you get the sort of specialist areas in terms of, you know, um, golf specific training, golf specific physio work. Um, and that can lead into um, nutritionist sleep stuff, things like that. Yeah. Cool. So then um, I'm just relating it back to what I know better, really, James, in terms of football. So we've, we've you spoke about the kind of uh, report that they would get pre-tournament. How does it look after the tournament then? Are, are you feeding back to them based on the, the stuff that they input into the app? And, and kind of how about, how does that debrief kind of look after a tournament? Yeah, again, very different. Um, one of my players wants something every week. Um, and every Tuesday after the tournament, he'll get a, a weekly summary. Mm. Uh, and basically, that it is what it is. It's a summary. You've you've done this really well. You've lost ground here. Um, and it, if there starts to be a trend in what I'm seeing on a on a week to week basis, that's where I might go to the coach and say, "This is coming up two three weeks now." There you go. That's your area to to dive into. Um, other players, it will work very much through their team on a weekly basis or every couple of weeks discussions. Maybe not as um, maybe not in terms of reports, but just a general communication yeah. and feedback from whoever's been out there during the week. Um, and then other players, it's in blocks of, of sort of, you know, they've played a run of tournaments. I've got a three week break. Let's look at it uh, and see what's what. Um, so I've got um, I've got players doing all three different uh, sort of methods, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and it can be it can be quite varied. There's no right way. Um, I think it's like it's individual. So it, it's really what the player the player wants. Yeah. Perfect. So, and then in terms of just going back to the, the data and the data collectors and the metrics, so you mentioned they've obviously, like in any sport, really, they develop it over time and I'm sure they will continue to do so. So the the strokes gain you mentioned is one that's kind of popular at the moment. Where do you see it changing in the future, James? Is there anything that you'd like to be able to kind of capture and analyze or maybe you're, you're thinking X, Y, and Z might be good to have, but it's not quite there yet. Where do you kind of see it going um, into yeah. the future? So that's a really good question. I think that's really what we're trying to do. Um, I think there's a limit to what can can be done on tours on and how they collect the data. The you know the the people collecting the data on tour they don't know the club the players used quite often. They don't know where the player was actually aiming um, relative to to where the pin is. Yeah. Um, and that's really what we've tried to do. So I, I think at the minute. From from our standpoint, we, we're pretty much where we want it to be. Um, there's nothing really that we've had from a player where they want to see more of this or or whatever. So we're we're pretty happy with that side of things. And and I think in terms of um, maybe what the TV could do or what the tours could do to offer more to the public, I think it would be more of a case of sort of in in play stats. So like this club's being used. Um, how easy that is, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Um, just because of the nature of of the sport, um, but in, that's probably the the next step. I think is more having live sort of data going round. Yeah, perfect. So one thing I do ask every guest uh, that we have that have on here, James, is basically for a bit of advice. But I'm going to ask you this in two parts. So um, you mentioned earlier that the data, or at least some data, is accessible for free online. So I'm sure there'll be people watching this that obviously have an interest in sports analysis and also golf, and they want to maybe tie that together. So question one is um, how 
what, what would you say to someone looking to maybe with a bit of an analysis background that wants to get into golf? What would you kind of say that they could do to kind of uh, follow that kind of career path? I think um, that's a good question. I think, first of all, get a good understanding of so that what data is available from from the current golfing world yeah. um, and then sort of put your own put your own spin on it then try and do a little bit of research yourself once you've once you've got that that's where you can then maybe start to separate yourself from from the next person um, and you can hopefully get to tournaments um understand how the to- tournament environment works um, and then ultimately it it comes down to working with players so you might not be able to go straight on tour and work with a top 100 player in the world, but you could go to um, counties in the UK and say, okay, let's try and, uh, you know, can I do the analysis for your team? Mm. Um, see what you can start building up. You do that for elite player, might get into the England setup um, and then that sort of spirals from there really. And, and that is a little bit like what we've done with the app um, where we've got a lot of, um, elite colleges on there. We currently have, um, I think it's the number three player in the world in the amateur yeah. golf rankings. He uses it through the college. He won the US amateur this year. He's won the US junior amateur. We would like to think he's going to continue using the app going forward. Yeah. And that's sort of where we would then hopefully try and um, bring them on board as a client and to, as the next progression. And it's similar for anyone trying to get into it, sort of learn your stuff, try and offer a service to teams, individuals, elite players, and hopefully they continue to progress and then you build your reputation that way. Yeah, sound. And then in terms of the the, the second part of the advice question really is uh, more of a selfish question. So how, um, to, to the average rubbish golfer, what, what's one piece of advice you could you could give if someone's looking to improve the game um, at that lower level really, just, just one piece? One piece, uh, cut doubles or worse off the scorecard. Um, and that's probably going to come down to tee shots for, for most sort of your standard amateur golfer. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, is there any any kind of books, podcasts that you want to give a shout out to while you're on? Well, I'll link the app below so people can check that out. But I do ask people, and it doesn't have to be golf related, sport related, anything that you consume that you want to give a shout out to, James. Really? Yeah, I think um, the probably the best one is uh, Mark Brody, who who designed, uh, created, strokes gained, uh, every shot counts. Uh, that's a really good one for. Yeah. For anyone wanting to understand um, what strokes gained is, what analysis, deep level analysis is really like in golf, I think that's great. Um, and that would be the the one I would go to. Perfect. I will link that below. I'll link the app below for people to get more information on that too. So um, that's everything I, I had, James. Is there anything else you want to you say before we kind of wrap it up? No, that's everything. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, hopefully it's been uh, fairly insightful on, on the golf side. No, it's been really good, really interesting. And like I say, I'm, I, I was curious to know about the data because I know there will be a lot of people, a lot of people that I know of anyway, would like to kind of check that out and delve into that. So it's the fact that it's all available for people to get, that would be cool. So um, yeah, James, listen, thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate you jumping on. Uh, it's been great to chat and I'll catch up with you soon. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Yeah, James. Bye-bye.